Jimmy Carter. Jimmy who? Jimmy who? I don't know who he is. When he announced his campaign for the presidency in 1974, Jimmy Carter was a virtual unknown. The peanut farmer and one-term governor from Georgia promised never to tell a lie to the American people. As I've traveled and talked and listened and learned... And he inspired confidence and optimism in a country that sorely needed both. Despite the assassination of John Kennedy and Robert Kennedy and Martin Luther King Jr., despite the embarrassment of Watergate and so forth, we had within us a, a, a natural strength of, and courage that we could overcome any difficulty. What Carter was selling in 76 was that I'm an outsider, that I wasn't part of the dramatic events of the 60s. He said his name was Jimmy Carter, and he was running for president. Carter ran his campaign out of an old train depot in his hometown of Plains, Georgia. The imagery was hokey and homespun, and it worked. Number 39, Jimmy Carter, Democrat, 1977 to 1981, 52 years old, from Georgia. Would you place your left hand on the Bible and raise your right hand and repeat after me? From the start, Jimmy Carter wanted to be a different kind of president. After taking the oath of office, he walked the inaugural parade route from the Capitol to the White House, just as Thomas Jefferson had done in 1801. It was a wonderful political gesture at the inauguration because it demonstrated what the president should always demonstrate, and that's humility. Carter's family was always a visible part of his presidency. Daughter Amy had her own treehouse on the White House grounds, and hard-drinking brother Billy made headlines pitching Billy Beer. Jimmy Carter enjoyed softball and jogging. He was a graduate of the U.S. Naval Academy and served in the pioneering nuclear submarine program. He was tenacious, virtuous, and smart. Raised a Southern Baptist, he was a deeply religious man whose Secret Service code name was Deacon. He was a man of great faith, a truly good man. He said what he felt. I think he tried to do what was right by his standards, his Christian standards, in every instance. That doesn't always work in this city. Carter was seen in Washington as something of a weirdo because people in Washington were not used to presidents with deeply sincere religious beliefs. Well, we're going to meet our goal to cut that down 21 Carter approached the job of president with the same Protestant work ethic that had served him well throughout his life. He micromanaged the White House agenda, spending long hours scouring over briefing books and memos. Jimmy Carter had digested memos like the rest of us do hot dogs or something. He just, he scooped them up and he ate them. For President Carter, the Oval Office would prove to be a crucible where high ideals were challenged and often withered under the heat of political realities. He found the political games of Washington unsavory, and he mostly refused to play them. You've got to get along with those politicians. You've got to get along with that House. You've got to get along with that Senate. And uh, he just didn't do it. He, he would not play that game. I thought that uh, Jimmy Carter was uh, someone who was very idealistic, wanted to do the right thing, but I felt like he never had the kind of pragmatic political sense that you need in order to negotiate the power centers that you have to negotiate in Washington if you're going to get anything done. Carter's political reticence handicapped his domestic initiatives, although he did change the face of the presidential cabinet, adding posts for energy and education. It was on the world scene where he truly made his mark. He will go down in history as the president who made human rights central to his foreign policy. In the past, we had gone to bed with the military dictatorships all over South America, Latin America, and Central America, and so forth. Uh, I decided that we should reverse that policy. Without taking away anything from President Carter's real diplomatic achievements, the flip side of that coin is a, is a certain naivete about the world. Brutal, harsh, menacing. In his best moments, Carter's combination of religious idealism with a tenacity of purpose yielded spectacular results. None was more important 
from the 1978 Camp David Accords, which Carter personally brokered between Egyptian President Anwar Sadat and Israeli Prime Minister Menachem Begin. Carter took on the role as peacemaker in the Middle East despite strong skepticism from his advisors and the American press. And all those intelligent reporters and press people said, oh, come on, it's not going to work, Mr. President. It's, you know, not a good idea, et cetera, et cetera. And Carter proved to be right. And we, as usual, proved to be wrong. Surely, Carter enjoyed defying the Washington establishment. But he had a higher purpose in bringing Sadat and Begin to the bargaining table. I really, I've been a Bible teacher uh, since I was 18 years old. I, I taught Bible lessons at the Naval Academy Chapel when I was a midshipman at Annapolis. I knew the geography of the Holy Land. I knew the ancient histories and the challenges and, and so forth. So I, I had an idealistic ambition of seeing if I couldn't bring uh, peace between Israel primarily and, and Egypt and address simultaneously the problems of the Palestinians. Getting Sadat and Begin to sit down with each other was an achievement in itself, but getting them to agree on anything was a challenge of almost biblical proportions. I found that Begin and Sadat were personally incompatible. The first three days, all they did was argue about ancient grievances and, and made ugly remarks at each other. There's this extraordinary moment when Begin blows up and wants to march out of the cabin and leave Maryland. And Carter puts his hands and blocks them and says, you're not going. I'm not letting you guys leave until we get a peace accord. It took 13 days. But finally, an exhausted President Carter persuaded Sadat and Begin to agree on a framework for peace. The signing of the Camp David Accords was the high water mark of the Carter years. Within months of that achievement, an energy and economic crisis that had been building throughout the 1970s sent Carter's approval ratings plummeting. Does Jimmy Carter deserve the blame for the stagnant economy? Of course not. But did he do anything to exude consumer confidence? No. There was a perception that this was a good and decent man who was in over his head. The summer of 1979 gave birth to one of the lasting images of the Carter years, Americans waiting in long lines for gasoline. The crucible was beginning to overheat. The erosion of our confidence in the future is threatening to destroy the social and the political fabric of America. The president intended this 1979 Oval Office address to be a national pep talk, but opponents famously dubbed it Carter's malaise speech. Everything he was saying was very true, but American people don't want to be scolded, and if something's going wrong, they don't want to be told they're the cause of it. We hire a president to fix our problems, not to whine about them. As if the economic mess wasn't enough of a cross to bear, Carter was yet to face the most difficult challenge of his presidency. In October of 1979, Islamic militants stormed the American embassy in Iran, keeping 52 Americans as hostages. The uh, taking of the hostages was an enormous shock to the country. To see the American diplomats paraded uh, with blindfolds and uh, all kinds of humiliation uh, was a shock to the American people. Carter resisted calls for a swift military response, preferring the slow path of diplomacy. It was a decision that reawakened the uneasy feeling among many Americans that he was too weak-kneed to be president. But Carter wasn't about to start dropping bombs just to boost his poll numbers. My most difficult decision was not using military force against Iran. I could have destroyed Iran, all its oil fields and so forth, with a military attack. But I thought that in that process, our hostages would, lives would be endangered or maybe lost. My goal from the very beginning was to bring back every single hostage safe and free. A failed military rescue effort in April 1980 further weakened Carter's image. The 1980 election was held on the one-year anniversary of the taking of the hostages. Amid the avalanche of bad news, Carter lost in a landslide to an optimistic and tough-talking former actor from California, Ronald Reagan. 
Carter became obsessed with securing the release of the hostages before his term expired and spent the last sleepless days of his presidency conducting negotiations from the Oval Office. But on the morning of Reagan's inauguration, 52 American hostages were still in captivity. We are a nation that has it wasn't until Reagan was delivering his inaugural address that Carter was informed on the reviewing stand that the hostages had boarded airplanes and were preparing at last to leave Iran. They had been sitting in an airplane at the end of the Tehran airport for about two hours and a half before that time, just waiting, I think, according to uh, the Ayatollah Khomeini, until I was no longer president. Some speculate that the hostage release was delayed intentionally to hinder Carter's re-election bid. But all President Carter cared about was that after 444 days in captivity, 52 American citizens were coming home unharmed. I was euphoric with uh, joy and thanksgiving and, and thank God for answering my 14 months of prayers. I don't think I have ever had a more uh, happy and joyous moment in my life than to know that finally the hostages were coming home. Carter returned home to Georgia where he embarked upon a post-presidential career as a peacemaker and international statesman which earned him a Nobel Prize and universal acclaim as a model ex-president. In many ways, the successes of his later life were forged in the crucible of his difficult presidency. I think the main thing I learned was that you have to work with others and, and you have to have dreams of greatness and sometimes you can't be completely successful, but that you ought not to let the uh, poss possibility or even the prospects of uh, disappointment deter you in setting the highest possible standards of morality and, and ethics and honesty and decency and peace.